So far in this series, we've, we've spanned quite a few decades now looking at all kinds of different stuff about the evolution of the drum set. We've looked at double drumming, marching drumming, ragtime music, um, traps, and early jazz, New Orleans jazz. So now we're moving forward to 1919, just on the cusp of the 1920s. And as most of you know, the 1920s are often known as the Roaring Twenties, right? So what was going on that gave them this name and how does that relate to this music we're talking about and to the drums? Well, in 1919, the US Congress passed a law called Prohibition, which meant that it prohibited people from manufacturing and transporting alcohol, alcohol for drinking, because there was a lot of moralistic complaints that drinking was evil and let's get rid of this evil scourge on society. But usually, what happens when you tell someone that they can't do something, the first thing they're gonna do is run right out and do as much of that as they can, right? So all of a sudden, drinking becomes the cool thing to do. And, but because it's illegal, it kind of goes underground. And so the 1920s is called the Jazz Age or the Roaring Twenties because everyone decided to go crazy and party it up. And because drinking was illegal, you had the rise in cities like Chicago, but many other cities of, uh, as well of gangsters. You know, you hear of Al Capone and, and guys like that. And the reason they came to prominence and power is because they were manufacturing and bootlegging liquor illegally. And places where people would go to drink liquor were called speakeasies a lot of times. These were underground establishments. You had to have the password to get in. And when you'd go in, you could drink. And so what kind of music are you going to have at these places? Well, you're going to have jazz music because jazz music was also underground, illegal. It had been, you know, created um, and uh, put forward. It was an African-American style. And of course, we lived in a very segregated nation at that time. And, and again, it was not upstanding to uh, enjoy African-American music. So if you went to one of these speakeasies in the 20s, you'd see African-American jazz being played. You'd drink illegal liquor. It was very exciting. And of course, great dancing, you know, and jazz was great music to dance to in this time period. And jazz is starting to evolve now. It's been around for maybe 10 years. And so the bands are getting a little more sophisticated. We're adding more horns. We're building bigger arrangements. And we start heading towards what was going to be called the big band. So check it out. Here's a little bit more about what 1920s Chicago style jazz is all about. demonstration that I did in the previous segment and the Chicago demonstration that you just saw, uh, you might notice that the way that I'm playing the fills is a little different than how we play fills today, right? The way we play fills today, generally we come down the tom-toms, crash. So we crash on beat one at the beginning of the following phrase. But the way I was playing here, we crashed on beat four. So I'd be playing along And this is the way that fills were played and ended back in this early period. In fact, drummers ended their fills on beat four all the way until we get into the 1950s, believe it or not. And the reason for this was that uh, you know, you have to remember that drums were very loud, the rest of the band was soft and acoustic, and if a drummer crashed on beat one, it was considered rude, as if you were stepping on the other instruments in the band. So that's why this sort of idea of crashing on beat four came from. And it also comes from a New Orleans syncopated idea, which um, 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 um. So there was a stress on beat four there. So as a result of those two kind of combination of ideas, drummers always played their crashes on beat four. In our last segment, we were talking about the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, and how jazz had kind of really evolved as more of a, a, a popular art form, but it was happening with the gangsters and the speakeasies and all that kind of thing. So that's in terms of drummers playing jazz music. 
But just like today, here in the 21st century, uh, drummers have a lot of different things that they can do. You know, so a lot of us out here are what we call freelance drummers, and we maybe one day we're playing a show, and the next day we're playing a concert, and the next day we're doing a theater thing, and the next day we're playing in a club, and the next day we're playing for dancers. So there's a lot of different things that you could do, and drummers back then had the same uh, sort of uh, uh, roles. They, they would take on many different roles. So we haven't really talked too much about this, but one of, one of the really most important roles of a drummer in the 1920s was as what they call a Foley artist today, meaning a sound effects person. And you have to remember, this was back at a time period when um, you didn't have, you know, you had radio at this point, but you didn't have TV, you certainly didn't have computers. Uh, and you had movies, but the movies were silent movies. The technology wasn't there yet to have sa a soundtrack go along with the movie. So when a movie would come to a theater, uh, either they would have a piano player or in some of the bigger cities and as the 1920s progressed and things got more sophisticated, they would have an entire orchestra backing up a silent movie. And it fell to the drummer in the band or drummers, sometimes there'd be several of them, to provide all the sound effects. So if there was a gunshot, if there was a plane flying overhead, if a baby was crying, if there was a, a cow mooing or a bird chirping or a train coming into the station or horses galloping or somebody shooting somebody or somebody bending over and their pants ripping, well, the drummer was responsible for all of this. And this got to be pretty sophisticated. Uh, and you could see sheet music from the period and there would be all kinds of cues for what instrument a drummer had to play. And so like today, drummers had to, had to you know, have pretty large setups in these theater circumstances. Or if it was a, a radio show, they were, you know, somebody was listening, the drummer was providing all of this filler, this background sound effects to bring the, the, the radio production to life. So what you're about to see next is something that probably you're not going to see anywhere today. This is the one and only place to check this out. And it's a demonstration done by William F. Ludwig III, who is the grandson of the founder of the Ludwig Drum Company, the original William F. Ludwig. Now back in, we have already talked about in an earlier segment that William F. Ludwig and his brother were the ones that invented the bass drum pedal design that we still use today. And of course, we all know that they also created the Ludwig Drum Company. But prior to getting into that, William F. Ludwig was a champion rudimental drummer and he toured all over the country and was, a, was one of the most important theater drummers in the Chicago area. So his grandson, William F. Ludwig III, has inherited all of his grandfather's traps and noisemakers, and he's going to do a demonstration for you right now of what it was like for a trap drummer, either in a silent movie or a stage show or a radio show, back in the 1920s. My grandfather and his brother, uh, William F. Ludwig Sr. and Theobald Ludwig, started out the drum company by having an actual drum shop that they would do repairs and help people tune their drums and keep them uh, operating properly. As time went on, people would say, come to them with certain needs and say, I need this sound or I need this drum to do this or this piece of equipment. And so they became uh, inventors of sound effects, which we have here today. In those days before sound, the drummers were behind the screen watching the movie and doing the various sound effects along with the movie to make it more entertaining for the audience. One of our uh, items that we have is the gunshot sound effect. And this actually holds 22 caliber blank shells. And then you close this down, have it on the table, and strike it with a hammer or a drumstick or whatever you have handy. The train effect is really interesting because it's so simple but effective and then they even added this on as a separate item. You could get it with or without the bell which I thought was pretty interesting. But this has a series of door springs inside. This is looks like it was some kind of a file of some sort that they just saw it and picked it up and said let's try that and it worked and that's the way he did most everything. That just slides in there and then you go if you're starting the train is just starting out let's say
and you can increase the volume, speed, to really give the true effect of a train departing. And uh, they also had to build items that could be transported because these, these percussionists were going from theater to theater. It wasn't always the same theater. Different train whistle, a boat whistle. So in the movie script, we say the sheriff rode into town and these are the horse's hoofs that create that sound effect. And also, uh, we say that the sheriff, when he arrived in town, went by the uh, blacksmith's uh, shop where he was shoeing a horse. And then he goes by the schoolhouse and hears the bell tolling. Then also as the script continues with the Clancy brothers getting off the train, when the train stops, uh, a dog nervously barks in the distance. Might have been a little ill at the time, but it, nevertheless, it's a dog. And we also have another sound effect that I don't have with me that's a large version of this. It's about this big around, it's on the floor, and you pull the uh, cloth up on that, and it's a lion roar. So it's the same concept, just a little deeper. This is just a hollow metal cylinder with a type of head on it, and you just slide a cloth over the string. Along those lines of the whistles, we also have the basic siren and duck call. Which has been around forever. But these are all the tools of the trade of the percussionist in the silent movie era. And this rather odd looking item is a cuckoo clock. which always comes in handy. And then of course, the cricket sound. So you may be asking yourself, when did movies with sound first start? Well, the first, what we call talkies, uh, were released in about 1927. And although this was pretty cool, they put sound with film for the first time, by 1930, all movies pretty much were coming out had sound, and the silent movie era was, was pretty much over in a very short period of time. And the downside of that was that literally thousands, tens of thousands of drummers were put out of work overnight, drummers who had specialized in doing all these sound effects and, and Foley effects. And if you think about it, for those of us who remember back in the 1980s when drum machines first came in, you know, everybody was, it's a very similar kind of a thing. Everybody was panicked. Oh, this is it. The drummers are done. You know, we'll be replaced by machines. That was kind of what was happening back around 1927. But as you can see, drummers didn't go away. And here we are in the 21st century. We're still around. We're still playing drums. We're still evolving with all the technological changes and musical changes that happen around us. So it's a good lesson to look back at your history and see that we've had to face these things before. New technology, what are we going to do? Boom, we go this way. So here we are. We're still here, baby. The next stop on our journey through the evolution of drumming and the drum set is 1929. Now this is a momentous year, uh, not just for drumming, but for the whole world. And why? Because you have the fabled stock market crash of 1929 that plunged the world into a global depression. Okay, and tough times for everybody. A lot of people lost their jobs, their homes, their farms. Uh, it was, it was a, a, a really terrible time. One of the things that helped people to get through these rough years of the Depression was jazz music. And as we've talked about in some of the earlier segments, um, we mentioned that jazz, which had started as kind of a small group phenomenon in New Orleans, uh, progressed in, in the 1920s really the band started to become larger and more sophisticated. And as we get into the 1930s, and we really head towards the mid-30s, uh, jazz is now um, 
America's most popular form of music. It went from being a real underground thing associated with mobsters and speakeasies and, um, you know, was African American in, in origin, but now it's, it's really being embraced um, throughout the, the country. And the bands have become big enough that in the 1930s, the big band emerges as the vehicle that delivers jazz. Okay. Now, a lot of times we think about jazz as, you know, uh, something that's more affiliated with maybe John Coltrane or Charlie Parker or Wynton Marsalis, something that's not dance music. But at this time, jazz was pop music. It was dance music. It was the thing that people would go out to dance to on, uh, on, a, on a Friday night. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the big bands and the role they served. Well, the big bands were there for people that were sort of you know, the whole world being very depressed at this time period, they made people feel good. It was, it was a lot of musicians, 17, 18 musicians, pumping out this wall of sound and really um, made people happy, made people want to dance. So the other reason that the big band succeeded in the 1930s was with the popularity of radio. And of course, radio at this time was now commonplace enough that most homes could have a radio or you could go to an establishment and listen to the radio. So, uh, you know, every night, Saturday night, 9.15 to 9.30, you'd hear the Benny Goodman Orchestra uh, play their radio program from some hotel in New York City, and you'd wait and you'd listen, you know. So starting in the mid-1930s, we really get what's now called the big band era. And this would dominate the American musical landscape for the next 10 years. If you notice, since the last segment, our kit has grown a little bit more. And here in the 1930s, some other elements were added. We still have some elements of the old kit with the bell and the block here. Um, we still have your kick and snare, but now we've added some more stuff. Uh, we've got toms now, which uh, we'll talk about when we talk about Gene Krupa. Uh, we also have uh, still some very small cymbals. We don't have big crash cymbals yet because if it, we had a huge crash, we'd knock out the other instruments. Uh, and then we have a Chinese symbol over here, and maybe the Chinese symbols of the period got a little bit bigger as well. Um, the, m the main instrument, though, that's different on this kit now is we have this guy right here, the hi-hat. Hi-hat makes its first appearance around 1930. And uh, the hi-hat really became the primary timekeeper for drummers during the big band era. Um, because earlier they had, one of the things they'd done when they were playing their, you know, New Orleans or Chicago fields, they would choke a cymbal. And, and so that was one way of keeping time versus playing a press roll or playing on the rims or playing on your wood block. Um, but they, this was really rather cumbersome because you had to use two hands, right? So um, they also had the idea, well, let's come up with a, with a foot symbol that can go against the bass drum. So they created something called a snowshoe symbol, which is a little foot operated symbol that sat on the floor. And now you could do this. So you could create a chick for every boom that you had. Boom, chick, boom, chick, boom, chick. So finally, at the end of the 20s, they said, well, why don't we take these and put them all together? And they had some different, uh, they had what were called hand sock symbols that you were like a little hi-hat that you held in your hand and all these sort of different variations. But this is what they ended up coming up with. And um, the reason it's called a hi-hat is because you had another, the, the, the early version of this sat on the floor and it was called a low boy. So the low boy uh, gave way to the hi-hat. So now you could play the cymbal with your stick and you could close it with your foot all at once. And this was a revelation and it really became the primary timekeeper during the swing era. The other major change that you see in drum set playing during the big band era is the switch over from the two feel. Remember at the very beginning of our series, we talked about how drum set playing was based on marching. So you had this very heavy boom, ch boom, ch boom, ch boom, ch one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, right? So the kick was always one, three, one, three. So one of the big advancements in playing during the 1930s, during the swing era, was this gradual evolution to the idea of playing always four to the bar, dum, 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 on the bass drum. So now you get this hi-hat going, and you get this four to the bar bass drum, and you get this very nice sound. Okay, so let's check out a little bit of the swing style playing right now.
Uh, who can tell me what made a drum set a drum set? The low boy. Kick pedal. Match grip. The sock symbol. My name is Daniel Glass. I'm a drummer, author, and educator. In 1994, I joined a band called Royal Crown Review. We were trying to figure out how to take the rebellious spirit of modern styles like punk and put it into big band and other roots music. We found out it was already there. I've been absorbed in this world ever since. I started researching the evolution of the drum set and the way that we play it. In the last dozen years, I've interviewed more than 60 different legendary drummers. I came to a startling conclusion. Perhaps more than any other instrument, the drum set is equipped to tell the story of America and American music. All of these immigrants coming from around the world brought their technology. Jazz music and pop music were one and the same. You could dance to it. 